Good morning and welcome to St. John's. And uh, with Dave Sankin sitting in the front row, I had to get up and check. I wanted to see if he was properly attired. Yeah. And he is, he's got his shorts on, so that's good. <laughs> that's good. But Dave is doing well and after his surgery and we're thankful for that. Um, Doug Block is out in the parking lot and he wanted me to express his gratitude for all your prayers and cards and, and all the rest as he recovers from heart valve replacement surgery. And, and he told uh, Susie that this is really his first outing. He's been to doctor's appointments, but this is his first outing. So Doug Block wants to say thank you to each of you for your kindness, your prayers, and your cards. Um, lots of things to announce. Now, the, the women's Bible study, which has been focused on the book of Genesis, is coming to an end. And how many more weeks, Susie, do you have? Two more weeks. Two more weeks, and then they're going to begin another study on the book of First Peter. And that's going to be a, a, a longer study, maybe 16 weeks, did you say? Yeah. So just a, a reminder, it would be a good time if you wanted to come to the Bible study but didn't want to jump in in the middle. We're going to start a new women's Bible study in a couple of weeks on First Peter. And Andrea is going to share about our... Um, Sunday School Palm Sunday event coming up next week. Yeah, we're excited to invite all of the students to church next Sunday. There's no virtual class, and we're going to have a special story, special activities, and an egg hunt for them, so hopefully the weather will be nice. Um, so anything else? Oh, yes, Jody's. Hmm? And... Um, Usually the, the youth group has a um, Palm Sunday breakfast. Well, we are, we're having something a little different so that we'd like to invite you all for some muffins and um, a little jelly bean surprise after church. So it's kind of like a reverse breakfast <laughs> on your, your way out. So we're looking forward to those different and fun activities next week. Yeah. It should be exciting, and, and again, our, our Sunday school uh, teachers have done just a great job of being creative and providing activities that'll be meaningful for the kids. And uh, I don't know if it was Jody or June who stepped up and said, we are gonna have you know, the kids with palm branches next Sunday during worship as we open worship. And then on, palms, on Easter Sunday, our tradition has been uh, because a lot of people would like to travel to be with family on Easter, the worship service is at 9.30, no Sunday school. So that tradition is still in place. So Easter Sunday, worship at 9.30, uh, no, no Sunday school uh, that day. So also one of the things, and I think we've, we've uh, dropped the ball a little bit because of all the, the restrictions and whatever, but uh, we have... Our volunteer sign-up sheet for 2021, and we still have a number of openings. And I think Joe has has that in his hand. Yep. And if you'd like to know what is available, and if you'd like to volunteer, all you gotta do is raise your hand and Joe will write your name down. So we're okay for, in April, the Smiths are gonna do communion uh, and altar prep and custodian, so we have uh, ushers and greeters for April. Anybody excited about doing that? If so, you can raise your hand. Mm -hmm. It's the easy one. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to keep track of it. You just gotta be here. <laughs> May, we have all those items open. Communion and altar. You know, the communion stuff is really easy now because all we gotta do is take out those little these little things and put them out so people can pick them up. So it's really easy. So for me, for communion prep, anybody want to volunteer for that? Okay, Liet's got that. How about custodian for me? Any family want to handle those duties? 
usher and greeter for me. What's that? What did Dave say? He's gonna, they're going to do Usher and Greeter for April. Well, the Smiths are already doing Oh, no, Usher and Greeter. Okay. Wait a minute. Now, the question is, do you think it can handle it? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I think after last year, I can have starting or anything. <laughs> yeah, Dave was our past council president. That was. Okay, May, we uh, alter communion prep. Custodian. Usher Greeter. June. Elaine Kerrigan has communion prep. That was a good decision, Elaine. Okay, custodian for June. Usher Greeter. August. Okay. Thank you, Dave. And uh, for August, Liette is signed, and Nita are signed up for communion prep. Custodian, usher greeter, and just a reminder, okay. You don't have to, because either Mike or I are here. Oh, okay, and then closing up, so that. Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay. Well, we already got Dave Hubert as usher greeter for June. She's going to be custodian. 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 Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so the updated list will be on the back bulletin board. And so if you uh, didn't volunteer, but after thinking about it, decide, hey, I'm going to sign up for a week or a month for that uh, responsibility, you can do it anytime. Right, Joe? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. What was Alice's question, Joe? If everybody knew what custodian involved and stuff like that. Yeah, we'll have that information and it's, we'll have that out, right? We'll yep. give that to them? Yep. So if you don't know what, what's involved, we'll get you the information, so. All right, thank you very much. Yes. The information is in the policy book and we're just gonna try to keep it in one place so we don't have outdated things. Uh, however, the policy book, which isn't supposed <laughs> to leave the church, is currently at my house being updated. So Joe and Susie are, are going rogue from memory right now and they're doing a great job, but before April and before any of the other signups, it'll be back here. So you just open the policy book up and, and look for the, uh, the jobs to help you remember yeah. what the little tasks are in between. Yeah, and the policy book will be in that little rack right as you go into the, the, the face center. There, the cemetery book is there now, the red book, and then the policy book will be in there. And that's a light colored. Uh, binder. All right. Are there any other announcements we should make? Yes, Celine. Today is flower sales turn-in day, and we're at like 95% turn-in, but I don't know if somebody took an individual form to order. Uh, if you didn't get it, if you could just get a hold of me personally to get it turned into my house sometime this week, if you do it in the next couple of days, I can get it added to the order. Um, or contact me and we'll work out something. Okay. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you for everybody who did the sales and for the it's so good about getting them turned in right on due date. Thank you. That's great. That's great. And thank you again for your participation in that fundraiser for the youth group and the women's guild. Uh, let's stand together as we receive our call to worship and sing together our first hymn. Our call to worship is taken from Ephesians chapter 3, where we find these words, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have 
power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Let's join in singing our first hymn, The Love of God, 157. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care and God gave, gave his son to win his every child is and pardon from his sin. The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever more endure the saints and angels' song. When years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains fall god's love so sure shall still endure and all a measureless end to adam's race the saints and angels song and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Could we with think the oceans fill, and were the scars of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe is prayed to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Lord, thank you for that glorious hymn and its message about the love of God, which is so wondrous so great, so immense, so free that we cannot fully contain it or understand it or comprehend it. But we thank you for that love which was expressed to us in all its fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Heavenly Father, as we gather to worship, we would just again be overwhelmed by the reality that the love of God has found a resting place upon us for all eternity. Bless our time together as we worship, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, and now shall be world without end. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, boys and girls and others in the congregation,
clocks are pretty important. And it's really nice that the, the council has made it easy for the pastor to see what time church should end because we've got a clock right there on the back wall. So I'm sure not to go too long. So you miss your lunch and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, all of us need clocks, right? Because we have things that we need to do. And boys and girls, whether you're going to school or if you're doing virtual learning, a clock is pretty important because you, you need to know when it's time to get on the bus, when it's time to get dressed to get on the bus, or if you're doing virtual learning like our, our uh, granddaughter Layla, you need to know when your first class starts and then when your next one comes up and she's got breaks here and she's got to you know, make sure she gets back and on her computer time. You know, last week, I wonder if there were some people who forgot to move their clocks ahead and didn't get to church on time. <laughs> I don't think that probably happened. But anyway, that could happen. But the Bible says there's an important event, that it's important that we're ready for it. Now, we're not given an exact time, but it's the second coming of our Lord Jesus. The Bible says he's coming again, and nobody knows the exact time, not even the Son or the angels. Only God the Father knows when Jesus is coming again. So guess what he says? Be ready. Be ready because it could come today or tomorrow. And so as those who love the Lord, when the Lord Jesus comes again, we want to be ready so that when we see him coming in the clouds, we don't say, uh-oh, because we haven't been living to please him. But we'll say, hooray, he's coming. Because we've spent our days here seeking to live, to praise him and love him and honor him by the lives we live. So time's pretty important. And for the most important thing, we don't know the exact time, but we want to be ready. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that time is important and time is important to you. We ask your blessing on each boy and girl and each family, and we pray that we would seek to love you and honor you by the lives we live so that when you come again, we can be ready to say hallelujah, praise the Lord, and not have to utter, uh-oh, amen. Reception of new members. It's our privilege this morning to welcome Adam and Leslie Smith as members of our church. Adam and Leslie, people uh, may have seen you, but go ahead and stand up if you can, holding your, your, your kids. But also along with Adam and Leslie, we also have Chase and Haley and Leah as important, important members of our church family as well. But welcome. Welcome, Leslie. Welcome, Leslie. And be sure to greet them, and you probably have, because they've been attending since, uh, I don't know, late summer or something, or early fall. So we're thankful that they've chosen to identify themselves with God's people here at St. John's. Please uh, join me, if you would, in the Apostles' Creed. It's printed in the bulletin, or if you just want to turn to the back of the hymnal, you can do that as well. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the life everlasting. Amen. The creeds of the church are important because they remind us of what the Bible teaches 
and the Apostles' Creed has been around for many, many, many centuries. Let's come before the Lord in prayer together. Lord, we are thankful for Adam and Leslie, Chase, Haley, and Leah, and last week, Elmer and Marcy, because, Lord, I believe that St. John's is a wonderful expression of what it means to be the body of Christ. And so it's always exciting when people feel like they'd, be, they'd like to be a part of that expression of your body here at St. John's. Continue to give us patience and endurance as we make our way through the pandemic and all the challenges that it continues to present to all of us. We're grateful. We're grateful that Carrie Eichens is home after yet another surgery on her spine. She is grateful for all the prayers that have been lifted up on her behalf. We continue to pray for Carrie. We also pray for Carrie's dad, Danny Schwanke, who recently fell and tore his rotator cup right now. It doesn't appear that Denny has to have surgery, but we pray for healing for him. We continue to pray for those who have had recent surgeries. Doug Block, as he recovers from heart valve replacement surgery. Sharon Milkey from shoulder surgery. Dave Sankin from hip replacement surgery. We also pray for Jan Alslaben, who is awaiting knee surgery in April. We continue to pray for the healing of Randy Kinnick. We pray for Sherry Smith and her dad's condition, which is very tentative at this point in time. We pray for protection for Adam Smith and other law enforcement officers as the trial of Derek Chauvin ramps up in Minneapolis. We pray for the city of Minneapolis, its residents and businesses as the trial of Derek Chauvin may result not only in protests, but violence again. This morning, we remember the violence of the cross on which divine love was lifted up when Jesus suffered there for us and our sins. Lord, we pray that during these difficult times, you would keep our eyes focused on you and the blessed hope that will one day be a reality for all those who belong to you and love you from the depths of their hearts. And now, Heavenly Father, we continue to offer up our prayers as we share together in that prayer that you gave to your disciples then and now as a model for prayer when you said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As Mary plays our offertory piece, may we meditate on how fortunate we are to be blessed by God in so many ways, uh, even beyond the blessing of Jesus as Lord and Savior.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, in the midst of these challenging times, we have much for which to be thankful. And as Mary played just a moment ago, the reality is the King is coming and all the glorious promises that you have made to all those who belong to you will find their fulfillment in that day. Thank you for the privilege of offering back to you a portion of what you've entrusted us to use as your servants here on earth. And we look forward to that glorious day when we will reign with you in heaven forever and ever and ever. In Jesus' precious name, amen. May we continue our worship as we sing together hymn number 757, Soon and Very Soon. That's good because I might screw that up. So thank you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> That's why she's led that. 757. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Hallelujah. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> I don't think I got that right yet, but anyway, we'll live with that. Years ago, I remember in particular Doug Oldham singing that song. He's a great big guy, and he, he really could belt out these gospel hymns, and I remember him very fondly. This morning, our scripture reading is taken from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. And it is concerning the blessed hope which belongs to all those who believe. Follow along in your own Bibles if you'd like, or use one of our pew Bibles. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say, no ungodliness and worldliness teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, 
who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Here ends the reading of God's word for this morning. Now, the first century believers to whom Paul was writing stood in a unique position. Many of them had walked with Jesus and saw him after his resurrection. For others, the events of the crucifixion and resurrection were still fresh in their minds as the gospel spread quickly in the world of that day. And it was persecution that provided the fuel for the rapid expansion of the gospel and Christianity, along with a tremendous sense of hope and expectancy about the second coming of Christ. They even coined a phrase to describe that hope and expectancy, the blessed hope. As believers today, we are not facing severe persecution for our faith, but we do live in a very difficult time in light of the pandemic and all kinds of political and social upheaval. We too need a word of encouragement and these words from Titus chapter two certainly represent that for us as well. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great Savior, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all the wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. We've all experienced sitting in a doctor's office, maybe even recently. But before you get to see the doctor, there's always a period of sitting in the waiting room, filling out paperwork, etc., until the door opens and the nurse calls your name. And if you think about it, while sitting in the waiting room, you never receive the information or the advice or the healing touch of the physician you were hoping for. That moment came when they called your name and you had the opportunity to see the physician face to face. That's why Paul refers to that moment when we will see Christ face to face as the blessed hope. It will be in that moment when we will receive all that Christ has promised to those who believe. Paul that describes that event in greater detail in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's why here in Titus chapter 2, Paul refers to that glorious moment as the blessed hope. But let's look at how Paul begins that section, verse 11. In verse 11, he talks about the place of God's grace in our lives. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It is the grace of God that brings salvation, not works, not effort, not good looks, not success in the business world or on the athletic field. It is the grace of God that brings salvation. It is only by God's unmerited grace and favor that anyone is saved and the fullest expression of that grace has appeared in the person of Jesus Christ. Grace is God's free and unmerited favor towards us, 
but it cost God the life of his own dearly loved son to make his saving grace available to us, who apart from the saving work of Christ are dead in our transgressions and sins now and forever. But the grace that makes us his own and heirs of all the promises that Christ has made to those who belong to him only comes to us by faith in the saving work of his son who suffered and died alone to make us his own by his suffering in death, clearing the record of sin that God could rightly hold against us, removing the barrier that separates us from God, the God who created us. That grace, that saving grace, comes only through faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in our lives. And that grace that is ours in Christ Jesus changes us, as we're told in John chapter 1. As many as received him, as many as put their faith and trust in him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. When we put our faith and trust in Christ, we are born again, and a whole new life begins. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Verse 12. It's in verse 12 that Paul addresses what saving grace teaches us. Verse 12, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. It teaches us to live according to a new set of standards, God's. It teaches us to say no to a way of life that has little or nothing to do with God or what pleases him, living only to please ourselves, indulging ourselves in all those sinful and selfish desires that the world around us says are okay. Instead, it teaches us to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age, and we can do so by the presence of his Holy Spirit's power at work in us. Here are a few other verses that flesh out what it means to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. From Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul tells us, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Where do we find that? That happens as we saturate our hearts and lives with the Word of God under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. From Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, we find these words. And I am now trying to win. Oh, he asks the question Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Then from Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you desire will be given to you. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or the material things of this world. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, 
If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The saving grace of God in Christ teaches us and empowers us to live lives that bring honor and glory to the one who redeemed us by his blood. But learning how to live to please God takes time. It's a process that will go on until Christ comes again. Earlier, I mentioned about sitting in a doctor's office waiting. The Christian life is not just sitting around waiting for the end to come or waiting for Christ's return because we put our faith in him. The Christian life is living in expectation of his coming, living in such a way that Christ will be pleased with how we are living when he returns. Living in such a way that we will not be ashamed by the life we are living when he comes. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure from 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. The saving grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Verses 13 and 14, what is the blessed hope we as believers are waiting and longing for? While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. That blessed hope is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are waiting to see Jesus Christ face to face. Earlier I read from 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. Let me read those verses again. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. We just went over that, I think, last week in our confirmation material. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And that's what I'm trying to do this morning, encourage you with those words. The reality is that we as believers look forward to and long for his promised coming when we will see him face to face. But in that moment, we will not only see Jesus face to face, our bodies will also be changed forever. Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 50. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, 
and we will be changed, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the, the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. In that moment, we will not only see Jesus face to face, but our bodies will be changed. These mortal bodies will, that are subject to decay and death will be clothed with imperishable, immortal ones. And in that moment, we will personally know beyond a shadow of a doubt that death has been swallowed up in victory. But notice, Paul ends that glorious declaration in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice that he ends it with another exhortation to godly living as we wait for the blessed hope of his coming. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It assumes that while we are waiting, we are in the process of living for the Lord and serving him because all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. As we consider the reality of our blessed hope, make sure that by the grace of God, you are doing everything possible to be ready when that day comes, because it could be even today. Let me close where we began this morning with those words from Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, while we are waiting for this blessed hope, your appearing it will change everything for all eternity. Give us the grace that we want to be ready, we want to be unashamed of the life that we are living when the day comes. Grant us that grace. Grant us that determination. Grant us that perseverance. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together our closing hymn, We Shall Behold Him, 755.
we shall behold him face to face in all of his glory. Oh, we shall behold him, we shall behold him face to shout of his coming, the sleeping shall rise from their slumbering place, and those who remain shall be changed in a moment, and we shall behold him and face to face. We shall behold him, we shall behold him face to face in all of his glory. Oh, we shall behold him, we shall behold him face to face. Our Savior and Lord. Lord, we look forward to that day with longing, with excitement, with anticipation. But as we are waiting, give us the grace to live for you today. In Jesus' name.